Dr. Navi Pillay, what a privilege it is to welcome you to the year that made me. Thank you very much for inviting me, Hugh. What was the first recognition that you can recall of the racial injustice that was existing in South Africa at the time? Well, we lived uh, in, in racially segregated enclaves and ours was almost a, a slum. We had no sewage and water and so on. So you knew that you lived in a separate area and you were at school only for Indians. And around Christmas or festive seasons, my father would drive us past the beachfront and we were not allowed to step on that beachfront and you try and tell little children you can't go to this park or you can't go to the beach I think every child growing up under apartheid was born being aware of apartheid uh, and the rules How did this turn into a passion as it plainly must have been a passion for the law and how did you go from this poor slum-dwelling bus driver's daughter to Harvard University and a doctorate of law? Well, I'm very much aware that it's all South African children of colour uh, who were more or less in the same position as me. Now, I managed to get to university. The school principal went around to this poor community and said... We have a student here with potential. We think she should go to university. And that is what they did. Those parents who I bet would have preferred to spend their pennies on food for their families or to send their own children to university gave their money so that I could go to university. And years later, you know, when I returned as high commissioner, I met a whole mass of them. They invited me and I said, thank you. And I want to report this is what I've done with my education. So it was a good day for me. You returned on their investment, but it is remarkable that they obviously were sufficiently convinced by what this teacher was saying about you to think that they would make that sacrifice. That's right. You know, this is why we say community should be playing a role to support children. As I look back, I thought, look how I benefited from that. And today I see such a difference. Nobody seems to care. I wonder when you were a young lawyer, freshly graduated, you were in a world in which the law, the very instruments of justice, were used to propagate the deepest injustice. How did you, as a young lawyer, front up to that reality that you were going to have to fight in a system for something as basic as the right to simply be within apartheid South Mm. Africa? You know, you're so right, Hugh, to zero in on that because that troubled me every day. You knew the maxi picture was total injustice, discrimination, and that everything worked against black people, whether it's housing, license, other black lawyers, African lawyers could not open offices in the city or live in the city. So there were big issues. Uh, When Nelson Mandela first appeared in court on a minor charge, he refused to plead. He said that this is a a white man's court and I don't expect justice. And he was told, well, that's a fact. It is a white man's court and you can't do anything about that. I felt I was being hypocritical, that I was deluding them into thinking that we can get justice in the courts. When the laws themselves are unjust. Racism is entrenched in that law. However, that was the tool that I chose. I chose to fight through that law. And this is why eventually I applied for a scholarship and went to Harvard, because I wanted to know about international standards. Apartheid to me was so wrong that I craved for a a universal system of values. When you stood in a courtroom as a non-white lawyer, did you have at that time equal standings in front of that court? The court was segregated in terms of the uh, audience. Everybody had to enter through separate entrances and the uh, lawyers' tables were segregated as well. 
And so you were humiliated every step of the way. I mean, what confidence can clients have in us when they could see that we were held inferior position in the courtroom as well? So the courts were very much an instrument for implementing apartheid laws. I would walk, uh, you know, tap on the door of of a lowly magistrate. It could be in a rural court or in the city. And you had to stand, wait and wait, then finally you... I mean, you can hear him chatting with the prosecutor in his office, which he is not supposed to do. But as you walk in, you find he has his feet on the desk. He doesn't take them off. So you're talking to the, the, the dirty soles of his shoes. Uh, that's what I mean about how humiliating it was. We slowly learned, I slowly learned, to gain self-confidence and not get that inferiority to to get steeped inside me. So that was a learning experience. And with the power of the law, the words of the law, the principles of the law, were you able to find in that something that you could use against the oppressor? Yes. You know, I practiced as a lawyer for 30 years. We developed all kinds of strategies that you take a chance and, you know, you attack the apartheid laws on the grounds of human rights. I mean, I didn't use the word human rights then because we talked in terms of common law rights. The other thing I did is attack the use of torture by the security police, so I'm known for that. My husband was in detention under the Terrorism Act, as were many, many others, including Winnie Mandela, At that point, 51 people had died mysteriously in detention. And I managed to successfully obtain an order that the security police do not use unlawful methods of interrogation and use of torture. I didn't succeed in having my husband uh, released, which was my immediate goal. But the benefit is a long-term goal. You challenge it and then you take it step by step. Because Stephen Biko was killed under torture in detention shortly thereafter. And the ANC had observer status at the United Nations and they asked the United Nations General Assembly to establish a convention against torture. And that's how we got the convention against torture. The year that made you was 1994, you say, and I know what happened that year. It was, of course, the election year. I think it was April 26th or 27th when uh, they went to the vote. Tell us about that year and and why it was that year that made you. Can I just tell you a little thing since I'm here in Australia? I want to say how inspired we were that the Australians were the first to refuse to play cricket and rugby with the South African, all white South African teams and how much that inspired us because any kind of boycott activity in South Africa would have meant we would have landed in prison, lost jobs and so on. And all that translated for us in 1994 with the elections and our first democracy. It changed our lives. There's no way I would have been a judge had it not been for the 1994 change to democracy. Dr. Navi Pillay, thank you so much for joining us for the year that made me. Thank you, Hugh. Thank you so much for your time. No, thank Such you for a your privilege. Question. Yeah, enjoy your strength.